Yes. Hello, I'm Marilyn Hamilton, and I'm one of the co-founders of Living Cities Earth. And I am joined today at our Earth Day Summit with Marina Demchenko, who is also one of the co-founders of Living Cities Earth. And we're just delighted to have as our guest, Daniel Christian Wall. And so I'd just like to introduce Daniel and let us know what kind of a very exotic and global background he has. Daniel was born in Munich in 1971, and he grew up in Germany. He has uh, degrees as a biologist and a zoologist from University of Edinburgh and the University of California, Santa Cruz. He also has an MSc in holistic science from Schumacher College and a PhD in natural design from the University of Dundee. Daniel has taught capacity building workshops on a wide range of sustainability issues to local authorities and businesses. He's worked with the United Nations Institute of Training and Research, UNITAR, and the British government's UK Foresight. He is a LEAD, a LEAD International and Clear Village member. And he works with companies also like Camper and Ecover and Lush and the tur Tourism Innovation. I know Daniel through his connections with Findhorn, where I actually live in the Eco Village, and he was the director of Findhorn College between 2007 and 2010. And during that time, he helped to create an MSc in sustainability community design with Harriet Watt University. Daniel is a fellow of the RSA, the Royal Society for the Encouragement of Arts, Manufactures and Commerce, and is also a Findhorn Foundation Fellow. Daniel has been very much involved with Gaia education and he trained trainers for their Eco Village design education, what is affectionately known globally as the EDE program. Daniel now lives on Mallorca. He has co-founded Biomimicry Iberia in 2012 and also the IED, the European Institute of Design in Madrid. Daniel has worked in many conferences written many articles and is a very active social media participant whose articles and comments I often found, find in my daily feed and always enjoy. He's also the author of Designing Regenerative Cultures as a book that I believe came out of his PhD research. Daniel, welcome. Well, that was a long introduction. <laughs> nice to see you again. Lovely to be with you today. Yes, well, for the whole Living Cities Earth Endeavor, which is a new collaboration that now has connected over 50 people around the world, I thought it would be very interesting not only for the co-founders to learn a little bit about you, but also the viewers of this recording. So Daniel, we have many things in common in our love of being able to think of the Earth and actually experience her as a living being. And I have been attracted to your work also because you have used an integral model to be able to presence multiple realms at once. And there's another sort of very interesting connection through the biomimicry work that you've done to bees. And there's a bee person that I'd like to invite you to comment about, and that's Patrick Geddes. So Patrick Geddes um, actually studied not only humans in cities, but also bees and used, was a very early um, person to use biomimicry to try and understand how do humans connect their lives and their cities to their bioregions? Would you like to tell me why you were attracted to Patrick Geddes? Well, that's a wonderful place to start because I think it's, it's really instructive that sometimes people are a um, hundred years ahead of their time. Um, Geddes wrote a book, Cities in Evolution, in 1910. Um, he, he was originally a biologist. Um, I got into him partially because I studied at Dundee University, and he um, helped build Dundee University and was the first professor of biology and botany there. Um, but he didn't live in Dundee. He lived in the um, old town of Edinburgh. And at the time, the old town of Edinburgh was still the slums. It was where the low lives lived. There was prostitutes and and gamblers and and um, thieves and um, he to some extent invented the process of gentrification in cities by moving straight into the slums and then convincing the city to let him use an old building to invent what became student housing so he 
um, create, took, took one building and made it available for students and then got the students involved in whitewashing the walls and working with the people in that barrio and that area to um, clean it up, to make it, to make little gardens, to, um, yeah, just basically make it more livable. And in doing so, he then began a process that transformed this heart of Edinburgh, the Royal Mile and the, below it, the Cowgate, into um, what is now this beautiful city that, that millions of people come and, uh, come and visit. And another example of Geddes's genius is also in that area where he created what's called the Outlook Tower in Ramsey Gardens, which is right at the Castle Esplanade. Like if you walk down from the castle on the left, there's a, there's a tower. And in that tower, Geddes um, created a public education venue, a museum, that has the core notion of regenerative being in nested wholeness as a participant built into it. And we're talking 100 years ago. So you walk into this floor and the first level like the first floor is an exhibition of the world. Over a general introduction for, for simple people living in Edinburgh, wanting to just have a nice day walking through this tower of this is the world. And then you walk one floor up and then it goes, homes in to Europe. And then it homes into Great Britain and then Scotland. And then on the top floor of that building is a camera obscura, which was high tech at the time, that shows you the city of Edinburgh and the salutogenic nested design intention behind creating such a thing that in a very simple way helps people to locate themselves within nested wholeness is so ahead of its time. And, and the very fact that what you were um, alluding to is that, that Geddes as a biologist ended up being also credited for being one of the founding fathers of sociology and of town planning. And that um, once he get, gained a little bit of traction in Scotland, because he was so culturally creative, he also is intimately involved with something called the Celtic Revival in Scotland, which was the arts and crafts movement um, that, that of the, the, what's the other famous Scottish architect that, of the arts and crafts movement, just, um, um, Glasgow School of Art is built by him. I'm just losing the name at the, uh, at the moment. But anyway, he, he in this um, Celtic revival, he understood that if you want to change culture, you have to change it through arts and crafts and theater and dance and all forms of cultural expressions. So he then created what was called the Edinburgh International Summer School, which was a meeting of the minds of the time where he had Le Play and um, Heckel and um, students of Kropotkin and all these people come and spend some time in Edinburgh and basically have a public dialogue, something that is now common with this kind of um, Zoom um, and, 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 and uh, online blended formats. But um, the fact that people had intellectual conversation in front of an audience where people could just come in, no, no entries charged, uh, is, is so ahead of its time. And out of this international summer school grew what is basically the Edinburgh Festival today and, and the Fringe. So um, the, the impact of this man is, is humongous and the, the, to, to bring it home to why, why I think it's so important to remember him now is that Yes, a lot of us live in cities right now. Um, whether the cities that we've created are fit for purpose and fit into the scale of the landscapes they've been built in is a question. And whether they will remain at these mega city sizes in the long run is also a question. But um, if we want to transform cities to not be a degenerative influence on the living biosphere, the living planet, then we have to reintegrate them into the regions that they're nested in. And Geddes understood that. There's something called the valley section that, that Geddes 
drew and that there's actually a stained glass window in Ramsey Garden in that museums of the valley section, which shows the mountains, the river and the city and the sea and basically locates the city in the bioregion and then looks at where does where do the minerals come from? Where does the in his day the, the coal come from, the timber come from, the, the basic raw materials of provisioning the city? And plan the city within the context of its material and energy footprint and carefully look at the flora, the fauna, the hydrology, the geology, get us critically influenced um, Mumford. And Mumford's thinking was the, the spark when the young Ian McHarg, after being a military, um, like a, a, a Green Beret in the Second World War, did some training for, for veterans that, that happened just after the war. And it was basically Gadesian students that were training these war veterans in urban planning, the first town planning course. And that's where Ian McHugh developed his approach or continued to develop the approach that Geddes already was talking about, which was the overlay section of landscape architecture, that you, that you have to plan cities and landscapes with geology, the, the different layers in mind. He just used acetates, overheads, to put them on top of each other. And that then developed into global um, uh, information system, the, the GIS um, software that, that is now used in planning everywhere. So, so Geddes has fundamentally influenced how we think about cities. But what we've forgotten is that at the beginning of all this is that you have to plan cities in the regional context. You have to plan cities within the living fabric and context that they're nested in. And that's also the fundamental difference between sustainability and regeneration. Sustainability is an abstract conversation around um, solving global problems. Regeneration is a participatory collective exploration in a specific place of how to participate appropriately in the nested complexity that we're now facing. And it fundamentally flips solving problems and solutioneering into exploring local potential with the people in the place that that you can only work with regeneratively if you talk about it in the specific and not the general. So all kind of master planning blueprints and copy paste approaches of sustainability are just simply bound to fail in, in that way of thinking. Woo. Thank you, thank you, woo, that was quite a riff. Oh, yes, but <laughs> if anybody you were going to riff about, it would be Gettys. I was uh, introduced to Gettys through, I don't know if you know Dr. Ian White, who I mm -hmm. met in Canada that is now in Edinburgh. And so he introduced me to Gettys. And there's many times that I feel like uh, I've somehow tapped into that, that energy field because even with the attraction with the bees. And, and uh, from what you're saying, he was so far ahead of his time. I, I was amazed because I think it was about 1890 that he coined the term, think global, act local. And it's like, what? That was coined here in Scotland and in 1890, not, not sometime in 1960 yeah, or something. It's not a Greenpeace slogan. <laughs> it's amazing. And, uh, and also that he was not really respected so much at home and he went out to India and did a lot of work there and Jerusalem. So he actually had to go and get his global creds in different places than here. But we would not recognize, as you say, the Royal Mile in Edinburgh, if he had not done what he had done and we completely rehabilitated and restored and, uh, and regenerated to another level, I think recalibrated the whole place. So thank you for sharing those those pictures and images. And, and this, this idea of the regeneration kind of links to Marina's um, questions and curiosities about how, do, you know, you started to talk a little bit about the difference between regenerativity and sustainability. Marina, did you want to step in and ask your question that was really stirring up a little bit of conversation amongst even our Earth Day Summit group because you had commented on some of our terminology being used regarding sustainability versus regenerativity. And both Marina and I are both regenerators. So Marina, did you want to ask Daniel a little bit about what your curiosities were about regenerativity? 
Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for 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 this uh, uh, trip to the uh, to the past because I uh, I've heard about Geddes, but I didn't know so 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 much uh, uh, he, he, about his contribution, and it's absolutely incredible and amazing. And uh, I I just wanted to maybe to clarify, and perhaps it could be some sort of the uh, guidance from you on uh, how do you see uh, the uh, evolutionary uh, transcendence from the uh, uh, basis of uh, sustainability could be provided in order to come to the regenerative approach, in order to understand uh, not only what's the difference, but how we can uh, evolve to the understanding of the regenerativity in many, many different uh, uh, approaches, be it industrial development, economic development, social development, first of all. Uh, and of of course everything which is uh, connected uh, with, uh, uh, as we say it in Living Cities Earth, uh, human and well in harmony with each other and nature. What should be done? What what do you think? How we can transcend to this new understanding uh, of uh, a regenerative approach instead of sustainability? Well, there's there's a lot of places to to start to respond to that, and, and to some extent. Um, going upstream and starting with the the framing of the question, which is um, I've I've used it many times. It's useful, um, but it is actually also part of the difference between sustainability and, and regeneration. If, if we think of um, what we need to do now with regard to creating living cities, Earth, um, like a a planet where cities have a salutogenic health generating influence on the places, their, their local footprint, their regional footprint, and their global footprint. Um, then, of course, it's a transition from where we're at now to where that plan, the situation might be realized. But that very thinking is part of our mental models and organizing ideas that have created the sustainability mindset. Sustainability was um, well first coined in in Germany by German foresters um, from from Clausewitz, I think his name was. Um, but it was already with the mindset of how do we use nature in a utilitarian way? Um, like how do we um, grow our diverse forests in such a way that we can um, sustainably harvest from them? Um, and how do we replant and not deplete the forests. That was the, the intention back then. Um, and in many ways, we're schooled in the Western world to think of everything as problems. And then we talk about problems in the abstract and we define them ever more. And then we develop all sorts of scientific disciplines that give us an angle on this problem. And we bring in the scientists and create more data. Normally it has to be cold quantitative data. and then once we've defined this really abstract problem, we, we've identified how it shows up everywhere around the planet, but then we take it into the abstraction again. Oh yeah, it's a, it's a problem you can see in Rio de Janeiro and in Shanghai and in Tokyo. Yeah? Um, and then we bring in the engineers, the designers, the innovators to define solutions about these abstract problems in the abstract in design sprints, design hackathons, um, whatever you call it, hot houses, all these beautiful things. And then in order to make those, energize those, we link it with big money and the investors and the angel investors. And so we do these hackathons and then the best ideas get pitched to the investors and they then say, how do we scale it up? How do we bring it into communities everywhere? And that's the sustainability approach that is well intended, but it's mistaken in its approach because you cannot find solutions to abstract problems that are by definition then somewhat abstract to a problem that is not within context. And then you try to bring it back into communities and implement it in context. And then you're surprised that it flies back in your face because the community doesn't own it. It hasn't evolved out of that place. Um, it doesn't know the idiosyncrasies of culture, of specificities of place and its evolution. And so very often it doesn't fit. And so 
the regenerative approach says you cannot work regenerative. You, like there's a lot of talk about regenerative this, that, and the other. And yesterday I was on a on a wonderful uh, webinar with um, Carol Sanford, and what and one of the kind of checks she she reminded people to um, to do when they think they're working regeneratively but may, might not be is are you working in the abstract are you generalizing are you are you working on something that you pretend needs to be then in that exact way be done everywhere if that's what you're doing you might be talking about how to create a blueprint and master plan for sustainable cities and blah 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 but you're still in a mindset that you and your brilliant friends can come up with the theme and the pattern that then people just have to adopt and everything will be fine. And that's not working regeneratively. Regeneratively, working regeneratively is what Gettys did. It's moving into a place and creating the will, will and the vision and the narrative with people in place that makes them co-create and makes them want a different future that is theirs because they have stopped and shared enough to fall in love with their place, with the uniqueness of their place and how it matters, how each and every one of them has an essence, a uniqueness that makes their community unique and how collectively because of that, they have a uniqueness and how that uniqueness is informed and in humble service to the uniqueness of the place that is actually bringing them forth, the, the locality, the bioregion. And, and that is a fundamentally different way. Like at the same webinar yesterday, Joel Glansberg sh shared one of the, he's a beautiful storyteller, and he told the, the famous stone soup story as a metaphor for how you work regeneratively. You don't walk into town as three strangers and say, oh, we're hungry, we want something to eat, and, 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 and if you give us something to eat, we'll help you replan your village or something like that. Yeah? No, you sit down in the middle of the village square and put three stones into a bowl of water, and then somebody walks up and says, what are you doing? And you're saying, um, we're cooking stone soup. And then that somebody says, um, yeah, that sounds interesting. Um, if we're often hungry, um, so if we could make so stone soup, that would be amazing. And um, then the next person walks up and they say, oh, we could actually, now that we're more of us, we could do with a bigger kettle and somebody brings a kettle. And eventually somebody says, well, soups do better with salt. And somebody brings some salt. And then, oh, maybe a little, oh, I think I have some carrots. Maybe we put some carrots in. And, and before you know it, there's a wonderful abundant soup out of scarcity that has been evolved through a shared will that has been nurtured in place. And that's a very, very, very different way of working than all the well-intended, wonderful people who still think that they can master plan the uh, uh, cities into um, into a different future. And and so so really this way of working salutogenically is how do we heal being in relationship within nested wholeness? Our whole cultural narrative, and then, and actually I should make the loop to where I started there because you framed it as a sort of transition and as an evolution, as like we're in one mindset and now we need to move to another mindset. And, and I think that, that once you go into this participatory approach where you shift from like in a scientific term the myth of prediction manipulation and control of complex dynamic systems which science tells us are fundamentally unpredictable and uncontrollable and if you take that scientific insight and you say okay then the best thing we can ever do is appropriate participation in nested complexity that is a much more humble approach and in that shift the the question of appropriate participation also can take you out of this ridiculous long-term future planning visioning something building the future vision and backcasting it and then creating the milestones of implementation all the things that we're trained to do uh -huh. and it brings you into 
your agency as an expression and participant in that nested wholeness. And that agency is both giving you the power to change the world, because what it says is you're an expression of all of this and you're a participant of all of this. So everything you think, say, and do, the metaphors you use, the how you give language to the world shapes the future of everything. So we are all incredibly powerful in that way. That's the participatory power that we need to reclaim. And at the same time, we can't predict and control it. We meet uncertainty. We meet change. We meet how this nested complexity will continue to unfold based on what we've done in the last 500 years. And which will cause us some challenges over the next few decades and and, and longer. Um, but we so so we move into this with humility and and the way of flipping it that is again different from sustainable thinking to regenerative thinking is not to frame re regenerative cities or working regeneratively as a new future utopia that now needs to be implemented but to just go, take a deep breath, look around you, understand that life is fundamentally regenerative. This is not a new adjective that will be surpassed by the next one. Like we went from whatever smart to circular to sustainable to whatever lean, um, and now it's regenerative. That's how people misunderstand it. We need to understand regeneration as a core impulse of life itself. We need to understand that our species for 300,000 years has been in this biophysical form capability of frontal lobe this big and, and, and all of that. And it, the developmental story is a Western story. That's the, 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 it's powerful to have an integral framework to let all different ways of knowing be present again. But the narrative of that this has to be a developmental spiral in a way that you'd hear and then you eventually you're going to get there um, is flawed to some extent because these states of being are available to everyone at any point in time. And there are plenty of people on the planet who don't see the world through the lenses that we're using to speak about all of this. And so if we come really back into the participatory power of nested complexity of us being shapers, co-creators of the future, then it's really look around you and see that there's regeneration going on everywhere. It's the people working for single moms and cities, the people working for uh, bringing back green spaces in cities, the, the people working for um, the, the urban permaculture network or um, connecting local farmers, regional farmers in the bioregion to direct um, customer cooperatives in the cities. Um, that the regenerative impulse of life itself is coming through everywhere because our species inheritance as being indigenous to life, expressions of life everywhere around the planet, our indigenous ancestry has held that nested wholeness as sacred and has understood our roles and responsibility in it. And we need to recover that ancient knowledge and see that all around us, regeneration is happening. And then suddenly, it, the, the way we work is unveiling something that is already happening, connecting the pieces within that nested complexity so they get, can begin to see each other again and begin to form a narrative where it's not siloed like our Western thinking has made us think of everything. Oh, yeah, these people just talk about badges and these people just talk about permaculture and these people just talk about single moms. And and so and also, don't they see it's all about badges? It's not about single moms. <laughs> and we need to overcome that and see that we're actually all working on the same healing of place, the love for a place, the biophilia that is at the core of understanding that the only way you can express your individuality in, in a, well, what our culture holds so highly is in service to nested wholeness, 
in service to your community, in service to life. And, and that's ancient wisdom. That's how the Vedanta has reconciled the ego to eco tension into seva, service to life. It's not about going from me to we. That's another swing of the pendulum. It's about integrating the me healthily in a we that understands that the only way I can serve me is to serve the collective, social, ecologically, and economically. And, and um, yeah, uh, I, sorry, I, I, I give very long answers, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's absolutely brilliant. And, you, you know, uh, it, it reminds that this Ubuntu approach about... Uh, uh, I am because we are, yes. So, so that th 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 that's uh, also uh, a, a very powerful idea. But, but uh, what would you um, uh, maybe? Uh, what advice could you give in order, uh, you know, maybe to cure this uh, uh, learned helplessness uh, about in our minds about that's not my. Uh, my case that's not my business because there are scientists there are politicians who could solve these problems make all these plans how to uh, help uh, an ordinary man to uh, a human not not only men and women of course maybe first of all women uh, and mothers uh, how uh, could we help people understand that uh, uh, th 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 that's our, that's uh, give them this uh, sense of ownership of uh, our pl places, our neighborhoods, uh, our uh, cities and eco, eco bioregions uh, around the cities. Uh, th th that's the matter of the culture, I think, first of all, in understanding uh, how, how I can contribute. What, I maybe think... you can g give I some think... advice on how to help people. I think Ed has already did at the beginning of this conversation. Um, how, how do we do that? Through an outlook tower, through a Celtic revival, um, in every place. Um, helping people to fall in love with their place again. Picking people up where they are. Not saying, well, I'm a badger person, not a single mum person, but to say, wow, you're a single mum person. Wonderful. This is so important for all of us. I kind of love the badger thing, but but I so value what you're doing. It, it's, a, it's a shift. And it's like creating narrative through art, crafts, um, celebrating local culture. And the danger there is, and this is really important because there's, we're now in a point in time where through lots of geopolitical shifts and, and, and the pandemic and, and a number of reasons, people have woken up to the brittleness of the system that has rushed into globalization at all costs and eroded redundancies at local and regional scales in service to some form of efficiency and economic progress. And we're now realizing that there was a point to have vital functions of a city distributed throughout the city in a decentralized way, throughout a region in a decentralized way, and that to make core dependencies to a production line that is on another continent is just really, really silly if you're trying to survive in the long term in an unpredictable, complex, dynamic world. And, and so the willingness to pay attention to re-regionalization is fundamentally different than it was 20 years ago. And the understanding that at the core of what's going wrong is a fundamentally degenerative, systemically violent economic system. Again, if you'd said something like this 20 years ago, you were far out there, outcast, not part of the conversation anymore. To, to question the GDP as a measure of progress in 2009, when Guy Education put that into its uh, curriculum, um, or in 2005 even, um, was radical to the point of most people dismissing you. Because what, what do you mean? Growth and GDP is central. Now you have prime ministers of countries saying our country isn't going to use this measure of progress primarily anymore. It's, it's a nice indicator, but it actually is flawed because so much destruction and um, ill health in the population drives positive GDP. So all, all of this is shifting. And so I think we're, we're at a point where people are willing to have conversations about our place and our region. 
But what's really important, because we also have a backlash into some sort of parochial localism that is them against us, othering, falling back into the, the, the small, like in Germany, the AfD and the um, Identäre Bewegung, the, this identity movement, is actually capturing some of these localizing, regionalizing memes and using them for a very toxic way of thinking. Um, so we we need to, as we become bioregionalists again, um, and we we work on cities within their living context in a bioregion, we need to think of this as a cosmopolitan bioregionalism, as a nested wholeness, as enabling people everywhere to do the same and valuing the exchange between bioregions. But we, we need to flip out of this spending vast amounts of money on things like COP on climate and COP on biodiversity, uh, 50,000 people descend on, on Egypt for a few days to, to blah, blah, blah about something that is again, abstract problem talking uh, and maybe proposing abstract in the abstract solutioneering to that. And if we deployed all those resources towards enabling people in place to have a conversation to say, it's not about fundamentally fundamentalist localism of we don't need mining and we don't need trade. We, we love this technology that we, makes us talk to each other from different parts of the world. Um, but we need to finally also face the biophysical facts of where we're at on the planet right now. We are running out of energy and resources in the way that we're currently using them. Like there's abundance on this planet, but the technologies we've built are dependent on scarce resources that are getting scarcer. And we cannot run a 16 terawatt civilization on a planet that biophysically only gives us maybe six. That means we need to reduce our energy and material consumption. And the only way to do that is to relocalize material and energy flows as much as possible, but have a nuanced conversation of what international flows of trade do need to exist to enable that. And in a, whether this is on diets, like we need to bring, bring our diets back into the region, but that doesn't mean we can't, whatever, trade certain luxury goods internationally. But it's, it's also about, um, in the context of that, the ubiquitous use of technology. Um, we cannot use that much technology. So all this talk about AI and, and, and our falling in love with um, the idea that if we had enough data and we get clever algorithms to work with that data, they can tell us what to do because we're flawed. I mean, this is, this is self-destructive for humanity and, and really dangerous. And this is happening right now at a hyper exponential pace. So we, we really have to bring the conversation back to a facing technology and facing globalization and being nuanced about how to how how these things can serve life and how they're currently destroying life and so um we've got our work cut out for ourselves in in, in this um but again even in, in framing it this way i just made the mistake of of leaving it in the problem space and i think that what we need to really do is to bring it into the specific off place and start seeing that we can and we are living and a lot of humanity is living in a very different way we're, we're we're still extremely colonialists in our in the way that we talk about all this because we're thinking of it just from our western perspective and and there, there are alternatives and and that's what, what was my critique um with regard to the integral thing that if we get too much into this developmental thing and not into realizing the different ways of knowing and different ways of being and seeing are co-present in the world and we just make them visible again and unveil them, then we're already far than half of the way there of creating the regenerative future that we want to create because it's actually all around us, because it's the core of what life does. Yes, Th thank you. Thank you for that. Your energy is contagious. Uh, a couple of things that you're saying remind me of an interview that I've already done with Jude Curavan, think, who I think you know, 
And so Jude is kind of reframed Geddes and says, what we should do is think cosmically, feel globally and act locally. I really like the feel globally because I think that is what puts us in touch with our reality, uh, even our agency and how we influence around us all the people and the stories and the circularity of the energy of life. And I also want to comment that even within the Earth Day Summit, because we are a very young organization in the Living Cities Earth, the ideas that have come forward have been very self-organizing. And I was delighted to see we have a whole day that is not in English. It's in mm. multiple languages. And one of our co-founders who lives in near Bangalore, Ranjani, is inviting children to work with clay. So they don't know how that session will turn out. But if you want to bring life into conversation, bring the imagination of children. If you want to feel, put your hands in the soil. I mean, we could be talking about Vandana Shiva and growing life out of the soil and the whole conversation about regenerating our capacity to have, uh, have our, our food systems be regenerative instead of industrialized. So I think those are the kinds of practicalities and also imagination that I see that you're calling forth. Am I off base in, in bringing in the children or the stories or the soil? <laughs> How could you? I mean, actually that reminds me of something um, that Marina said earlier with regard to the mothers. Um, all of that again in, in making visible what we can, what what has become invisible to Western society. The core function of nurturing life is not valued in our economy. Mothering, taking care of the elderly, intergenerational exchange between grandmothers and um, the, the grandchildren, all of that is in the non-economically clocked part of the system. So we made life's regenerative activity not count. That is, and, and what you're speaking to with all three of those is exactly that, the children and the land. Like again, we, we, we underpay and overexploit our agriculturalists, farmers, as the undereducated purveyors of a cheap resource. We don't understand that they are custodians of living ecosystems and that the thing they provide, the little bit we eat, is only a very small fraction of the service they provide to all of us. There's a reason why the primary sector is called the primary sector, primary productivity. The core source of all value generation is bio, bio, bioproductivity. Geddes, coming back to Geddes, said exactly. by, by leaves we live. This is where the botanist got his say. Um, by leaves we live. Um, that's what we have to understand. We need to re-green our cities. We need to re-green our planet. We need to reforest the... the, the half of the global forest has been denuded in the last 100 years, in the last 5,000 years, actually. Yeah. And again, that journey is, is a journey that is only five to 10,000 years old. Before that, our ancestors, every human being was part of a group of people that understood themselves as expressions of a living bioregion, moved migratorily through that bioregion and disrupted it in a positive way, had a salutogenic life generating influence on that ecosystem and made it more abundance. We now have the research, the wonderful research of Lila June on North American sites that were carefully nurtured into higher abundance by Native Americans. The way that she, in her research points out that the story that the Indians followed the Buffalo is actually the wrong way around. The Buffaloes followed the Indians because they practiced a way of seasonal disruption and migration that made the prairie more abundant for the buffalo and then harvested some of the surplus in deep reverence of these animals. That's a relationship. Like, I, I mean, I spend a lot of time in my garden now and the, the kind of 
communion and community that you find with more than human beings and the embodied experience as a gardener to have the land and each tree speak to you. Just before we got, got online, I did my little walk around the land. And at this time of year, the joy of knowing an individual tree intimately enough that from a day, from one day to the next, you see how the buds change, swell, turn into leaves, how the leaves change color, and how you perceive health and well-being, not just through the mind, but through sensing, feeling, and intuiting. That's the kind of invitation as we come back into our regenerative power, we also need to reclaim our human capacity because we've been so in our minds that Jung talked about four ways of knowing, sensing, feeling, intuiting, and thinking. Everything we've framed in language right now has most people in the thinking space but because we're passionate for what we're doing, they also feel something. And it is actually that feeling that really makes a lasting impact. It's not the blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and, and so how do we come back into relationship with each other and relationship with the more than human world where we value our capacity as living participants and expressions of this nested wholeness? The reason why we can feel like that is because we're not apart from it. We're expressions of it. And and that for me, yeah, like Jude's, I, I love what you would, but you like Jude's ex, ex, extrapolation of Geddes, Geddes's, um think uh, globally, think, uh, think, globally, think yeah. cosmically, think cosmically, globally, globally. Globally. exactly. It, it, but it's also you could say you need to think, act, and feel locally, globally, and cosmically. That's the the co-presence of that because ultimately of course there are always larger realities that we're nested in and it helps us remind and put ourselves into context but right now i feel that again the danger of this evolutionary um mo model to some extent is that we can disappear into a sort of um esoteric out of the imminence of the body conversation of the cosmic and what we really need to do is to come into our bodies again and, and understand that we are expressions of a larger being that is Gaia the living planet but that even that larger being is nested in a much larger system and that even thinking of it in those terms where objects are nested in objects because is 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 just a way of thinking and and that the real change is happening even beyond that in the non-material realm. Um but where do you start? Because we were saying how, how do you involve simple people? Maybe not with the cosmic story first, um maybe with something that is really relevant to them. And then bring it back. But it's it's simple simple things like just having a thought there with regard to cities, the, the light pollution, like the work of bringing cities back to a level of using light wisely that you can see the night sky would make such a difference in this cosmic connection <laughs> because along the long journey that we've had in this form as homo sapiens. We've sat around in circle looking at the night sky and you can't do that without feeling small and insignificant for a while. And that feeling small and insignificant makes you wonder the questions of who are we? Where are we going? Where do we come from? What is this all about? And if as a culture, we don't ask those questions we lose our way, and that's what we've done. Yeah, once more, you again um, stimulate all kinds of connections as as you're sharing the your your impressions and thoughts and feelings and sensing. And um, I'm I'm remembering some work that I've recently just encountered with Ian McGilchrist. I don't know if you know his work, where he's basically saying right brain, left brain. Actually, we have given our left brains all of the privileges 
when in fact it's the right brain that's doing all of this connection and patterning. And that really the sequence of how I understand what he's suggesting is it should be right brain, grok it, left brain, analyze it, and then come back to the right brain and release it into a much more generative, regenerative space in the world. So I, I feel this is really good and uh, wise instruction to, to us in the West. And I also am remembering how Aurobindo has influenced me to think of cities. So you take Gettys and go to India, and I don't know if the two of them ever encountered each other, um, but Aurobindo, again, very early in the 1920s, he proposed that there was a right size for cities. And the right size he suggested was about 50,000 people. Oh, I, little yeah. note to, to file, uh, there's about 50,000 bees in a wild beehive. Oh, isn't this interesting? Now, if you do the math in India, if there were only cities of 50,000 and you went forward to the time now, there'd be a little bit of short of maybe uh, a million or so people wouldn't have a place to stay because of his math. But the thing that I understood about his intention was two things. One was that individuals are connected to each other and their bioregion at that size. They become very intimately aware that they're not some separate place that's been stuck on a particular region. Um, and then the other thing that he invoked was something that he called a karma yoga. I have taken the liberty of creating a care ma yoga. So I say that one must care for itself so that you can care for each other. And all together we care for our places and all together we care for the planet. So caring for person, people, place and planet. And that kind of practice in my experience can be something that sets your intentions for how to connect with the highest and the best at all scales. And it also helps me to notice how has all of those, especially the planet, spoken through me during the end of a day. So I, I just feel that you're sharing this energy and love of life is bringing up those kinds of influences that have also flowed in, in the direction that I have been working with both integral city and living cities. So, so this is wonderful, just, just just briefly on that, because it's very often I, I mean, one of, one of the, to get people out of this, putting into the foreground, the design, the deliverable, the object of the solution, like, and understand that, yes, of course, we will have to create new products, new houses, new cities, all of that. But to foreground the verb, the process of becoming, that doing that enables. I, in my book, write a lot about that regenerative cultures emerge from people living the questions together. And you need a certain scale, a human scale, a beehive scale of living the questions together with relevance to, to a locality. And, and the most powerful questions that I think we need to ask in this daily practice, humble apprenticeship or pilgrimage of appropriate participation is what you were just referring to. The, a friend of mine called it the tree ethica, but it's actually something that you find in every indigenous practice around the world, that you ask for any major decision of what to do in your life, does it serve myself? Does it serve my community and does it serve life? Three simple questions. They're somehow also at the core of council practice. Um, and you have to have three good reasons on each of the three levels. It is never enough to have good reasons only on one of those levels. This on the one hand says to the greedy self-person, I need to consider the community and the planet, but it also say, says to the passionate activist trying to serve people and planet, remember yourself. Otherwise you won't do this for very long. And this is a marathon, not a horse race. We need to 
take care of ourselves. And so, yeah, it's wonderful that that, that you bring that into the, the, the working with cities, because I think these are, like, we have been given the original instructions. It is all there. We know how to participate appropriately in nested complexity. But we have now have the hard challenge of how do we harvest the best of enlightenment, modernity, technology, and science, and the thinking mind, and reintegrate it into the fullness of our being in 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 that way and and we will need bridge memes like i i love ian mcgilchrist's work but i i hesitate like i've I studied neuroscience the the dualistic left right and male female they, they're just so many memes still in that meta like the, the metaphors he used to explain this and neuroscience shows that there's plasticity between the brain um, if you have an accident, the right brain can take over left brain functions and the left brain can take over right brain functions. So um, very useful narrative that has me meant a lot to a lot of people, but but we are always trapped in language. And, and that meta perspective of understanding that precisely because we're always trapped in language, we need to do what you were alluding to. We need to trust our sensing, feeling and intuiting more. But we also need science to help us create intersubjective consensus yes. on how to bring sensing, feeling, and intuiting into the world responsibly. Otherwise, anybody who says, oh, I had a vision and we should all do that, that um, could become a demagogue and um, get others to follow him. Yeah. That, thank you, Daniel. I think one of the things we share is um, the awareness that in order to impact a system, one nudges, one sort of pokes it and notices how it responds and be responsive to the system. And I know that we could go on for another hour, but in respecting your time, uh, I'd love to have another conversation about your experience of community on Mallorca and compare it to the sense of community I have here in the Fintorn Eco Village. And so, Thank you so much for your contribution to this Earth Day Summit and all kinds of provocations. Marina, do you have a last word that you'd like to give for Daniel before he departs? Well, I, uh, I, I'm i saying goodbye with the deepest uh, sense of gratitude to you both for this uh, wonderful conversation because uh, I'm smiling in my heart and, <laughs> and, and on my face and uh, you know your uh, answer that we should that, that, that the, the, the main recipe is love to fall in love in the place is what uh, for, for the place yes is what I am taking with me in my heart and as an advice for many many people who really want to make uh, our places uh, flourishing and thriving uh, in harmony with nature, not, not, not only in, in our uh, egocentric uh, goals, but, but uh, serving for the planet. So, so love is the answer and it's so simple and it's so, so powerful. Thank you for that. And it's, and it's our natural state of being. That's, so, so you, can, you can kindle it. It's like a little, little glimming flame. That all, all, all it needs is a bit of oxygen. And in every place, you, that's what Geddes did. He went into the old town of Edinburgh and said to the people, this place doesn't need to be a slum. This place doesn't need to stink. This place doesn't need to make you feel you can't go out after six o'clock at night. And by people saying, yeah, actually, I love this neighborhood. I love these people. I have lived with them all my life. And taking pride again in that place and caring for it, that's... That, and we can do this every, everywhere, um, but we have to do it together and we have to like stop the inequality in the world and be like another thing that Geddes was leading in is he had a lot of privilege, but like we all do in this world, we wouldn't be using this technology if we didn't have privilege talk at this educated level. But it's not about feeling bad about your privilege because other people don't have it. It's about what you do with your privilege and how you bring it into service of self, community, and life. And that's what Geddes did beautifully. And his agency, his caring, loving intention, his last book was called Towards a General Biology of Life. He tried to really 
understand how do we integrate humanity back into the regenerative living cycles of a living planet, living planet cities. And for me, that's what we still need to do. And, and if you do work that 120 years later, three people can have a passionate conversation about, then, then you've created a meta design, a, a living meme that is actually salutogenic, that is healing the planet. Geddes's work is still going on designing and it, because it is part of an ancient lineage. It's part of the original instructions. And, and love is the, the easiest entry point, love, place, and people. Yeah. And it translates across all cultures and comes from the globe herself. So happy Earth Day. Happy Earth Day. Thank you so much for this conversation. I really enjoyed it. Likewise. Thank you, Daniel. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.